But I think I think Freud was was really onto something. <laughs> Whether we talk about passivity or activity, or you know, and it, it's 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 where you place, I suppose, sexual difference in a certain way, and how we relate to sexual difference on the basis of our sex, whilst holding it open as a question in terms of our, you know, being in the world. And I, I think it can't be foreclosed. And I think, yeah, what, what, what we're seeing, what we're living through is like a really dangerous foreclosure of this, as if there is yeah. a solution. The punitive foreclosure, sneer culture, the compassionate yeah. left. Nina, you're part of the compassionate left. Yeah. No matter, yeah, no matter, how, <laughs> many, um, no matter how many Guardian think pieces there might be. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. All right, welcome everybody. It's amazing to be joined by Nina Power uh, and to talk about your new book. Um, you know, it's it's, been, it's really great to have you on, Nina. Uh, obviously, have been reading your stuff. Well, well, read the first book many years ago. What is it, two thousand nine? Yeah. And I uh, haven't seen you in a while, but uh, I really, was really excited to see this new uh, What the Men Want. I'm trying to get it in the camera. There you go. Uh, which is amazing with Penguin. Uh, and this is Elliot as well. I don't know if you've, you've just, just met offline, uh, but Elliot and I will be basically hosting a series of um, interviews with people, I guess, uh, who are broadly associated or interested in analysis and, 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 and thinking psychoanalytically. Do you want to say anything about what it's all going to be, Elliot? Or Sure. Um Basically, it's going to be a philosophical and psychoanalytical take on world news, current events, uh, culture. Uh, I think there's probably like a gap for a solid weekly that does that. So that's what we're going to be trying to do. Cool. Yeah, like yeah. the week, but but not utter shit. <laughs> uh, with a guy. I, I really think there needs to be more psychoanalysis in contemporary discourse. I think it's an absolutely massive gap. We tried to do some on the the lack the podcast Ooh. I did with Helen Rollins and Benjamin Studebaker, with, but that's more through culture rather than a kind of psychoanalytic take on politics. But yeah, I think yeah. this is one of the major things that's lacking in our sort of collective thought today. Well, that's um that's going to be one of my questions, Nina, <laughs> about this book. <laughs> Um, yeah. But no, uh, anyway, let's let's get into it. I'm going to ask a couple of things, and then Elliot's going to ask some things, and then I don't know. We'll just chat and see what we all want to say about this. I, I absolutely loved reading this book. I, I I think it's fantastic. And uh, you know, at the end, in the conclusion, you sort of say that people may uh, decide, I suppose, to interpret this book uh, conservatively, you know, and that you can't sort of uh, do anything about that. But you know, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, to me, this is extremely kind of not conservative book i don't know if the word radical is right but it's extremely provo uh, thought provoking and, and confronts like a massive amount of issues that people really shy away from and especially sort of liberal culture tends to shy away from and so you know the fact that it it might you know the fact that somebody might consider it conservative is in a sense part of its kind of radicalism and part of its place mm -hmm. on the left i think it's absolutely brilliant what you've what you've done here um and i was going to start by asking um about that you know i mean probably like uh we've you know myself and other colleagues read your 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 book one dimensional woman in in 2009 um and in the start of this book you talk about you talk about that book and you talk about how you know 13 years later things are extremely different um and you you talk about um some of the things that have happened in that time, like Me Too and and, and like uh, this kind of puritanical, almost cancel culture uh, that has happened between 2009 and now. So, you know, that's just two examples, obviously, of, of the way th of things that have changed when it comes to relations between the sexes. But I thought I'd, I'd start by just sort of asking you to to talk talk us through that. Like, what do you think of it has been is so different about the time you, you wrote this book in compared to the time you wrote your first and in, in, in these terms? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think even One Dimensional Woman was in some ways looking back, it's almost like a kind of posthumous diagnosis of the Blair era. <laughs> now, now I think about it and, and the kind of way in which a certain kind of feminized image of labor in particular was being kind of pushed in the name of a sort of progressive, 
um, knowledge-based economy. Um, and yeah, I think, I don't know, many things seem to have shifted since then. I, I mean, one of them would have been, I suppose, the most controversially, I suppose, some of the, se- the questions around sex and gender. Um, but I think alongside that, and not unrelatedly, is this was this kind of attack on men, um, which seemed to kind of massively increase, at least in the last five or six years, maybe longer, which is extremely divisive from any political point of view, whether you're sort of a socialist, um, you know, it, it doesn't bear any relation to a kind of socialist thinking about men and women that you get in someone like Kollontai, for example, um, where class is more important, but sexual difference is still real. But it's about thinking about working class men and women. Um, and yeah, I don't know, there seems to have been a kind of collapse in, I suppose, sexual difference as a kind of founding principle <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, I was just not sorry to interrupt. There. I was just I wanted you to say more about. That. I was going to ask about that because one of the things you you claim is that we need to go back to to sex over gender as a as a founding principle. Yeah, I mean, just on the psychoanalytic front, I was just um, having another look at this amazing book from 1991 um, by um, uh, Juliet Flower McConnell, McConnell um, called "The Regime of the Brother." which is absolutely brilliant on this, which is following the collapse of the kind of paternal function. What she says and said has happened is like following the French Revolution as well. It's the brother, like it's the fraternal Mm. that's actually come to dominate contemporary sort of consumer capitalism, if you like. Um, I make a version of this argument in the book in relation to Mitchellick and the society without the father. So even though everyone's running around screaming about patriarchy, I mean, the reality is that there, there is, there's been a total collapse of the vertical sort of paternal function, right? So actually what you end up with is a, is a society of siblings where you have brothers and sisters basically competing in every arena, whether it's economics or, or sex, as in the dating apps, um, and in a way a kind of refusal of the desire to take responsibility which is also what the paternal function is, right? It's someone saying, right, time to go to bed or time to stop the party or, you know, time to look after yourself or do something that you don't want to do, um, which is why I think you have figures like Jordan Peterson mm. in a way, culturally or symbolically stepping into that role. And I think we have to sort of diagnose the popularity of figures like Peterson and some of the um, kind of manosphere or... Oh, Shall we? Oh, now you go. <laughs> you know? So, I'm like, whittering on, and he's like disappeared. <laughs> Don't like, worry, I'm uh, I'm still here. <laughs> the collapse of the uh, fraternal function as well. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, we devolved into the society of. Uh, is Alfie the father? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm here and I was listening. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, it's okay. But anyway, just on the, the yeah. McCannell book, she, she also makes the point that, that the. What's also eliminated with the collapse of the paternal function is the, the is sexual difference. And I think I've, I've sort of increasingly think this is kind of a problem in Western thought where, you know, going all the way back to Aristotle, actually, what you have when the moment you have a kind of binary or a dualism, it's very difficult for it not to then become a hierarchy. So people become very suspicious of all kinds of dualisms. Right. And if you read most contemporary theory books, the two things you can't do is binary thinking and essentialism, right? These are like the two things that you're absolutely not allowed to do. And everyone is very keen to say that they're not doing them. Um, So I think (laughs) that this is very symptomatic and revealing. Um, And I'm interested in what it might mean to rethink the binary, um, not hierarchically, but also not without responsibility either, if that makes sense. Like, what does it mean to, if you like, in a contemporary way, almost like reaffirm the value of, um, uh, amongst other things, sexual difference, um, the parental relation, the value of mothers and fathers, you know, and all of these sorts of things, which is which is why I, I put that, you know, provocation. Well, it's not a provocation. I mean, it's like, it's almost like an admission. It's like, yes, some of you might read this conservatively. And it's interesting that some conservative newspapers have read the book positively. Um, mm. And the only sort of real critique, and I thought they'd go a lot harder, frankly, was The Guardian, um, where they're like, oh, this is a bit, a bit reactionary. <laughs> and men are not like, nice Jordan Peterson as the 
As I know. It's so rude. It's like, at least put a picture of me <laughs> on my book. It's like, I'm not Jordan Peterson. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you actually ask her why there isn't a female Jordan Peterson figure <laughs> exactly. in the dad's chapter. I know, <laughs> it's so it's rude. You. It's you. <laughs> I was like, how, how could you do that? Um, but yeah, but they didn't go that hard. But yeah, I mean, predictably, I suppose they said men aren't under attack, for one thing. You know, they're like, you know, which yeah. is the standard left line. You know, it's it's always like this. It's oh, kind yeah. of like, oh, they're not under attack, but if they are, it's good. <laughs> um, mm. Which is the move. So, I mean, I've got, I think you'd have to be absolutely insane not to think that um, men or masculinity are, are, are not being condemned all, all over the place. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, I, mean, I actually think, Elliot, it's, it's, it's here that you're, you were going to ask about the question of socialism and, and, and right. compassion for, 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 for different categories. I think this is probably the place for that. All right. So, so you write, and then I wrote, wrote a quote. Because I'm very <laughs> Don't hold me to it. You're right. Ultimately, a more compassionate and understanding attitude to the suffering of both sexes in all its complexity and difference at the individual and group level is desirable. So the first question I have for that is, is your book part of a larger universal compassion project or is it more that critical compassion for men specifically is necessary now? Um, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I suppose, you know, I mean, it in relation to the question of like an older socialist tradition, like the left I remember and the left I still feel I'm a part of, like since I was like 15 or whatever, whenever I woke up a bit, um, would have emphasised these things about compassion and, and, and difference, right? It seems to me without being kind of nostalgic or misremembering, I think there was much more like forgiveness and, you know, um, understanding of, of, of well, in, in a way, the fact that life is difficult for everybody. Um, and, I, you know, thinking about my own relationship to men that I love and have loved, you know, I've had three male friends commit suicide. You know, it seems uh, if men were doing so wonderfully well, I don't think we'd be seeing like these insanely high suicide rates and these, you know, feelings of very obviously of despair. We see that right. very manifestly in the white working class in particular, not only white working class, but in America with the deaths of, you know, the deaths of despair in relation to like the opioid crisis. Um, you know, that in a way that the question of class and um, sex does intersect, right? Like it's not obvious that when we talk about male privilege, we can really um, apply that to men who often inhabit the <clears throat> extreme forms of <clears throat> addiction, poverty, homelessness, self-harm and, and violent behavior right so it's yeah I so I think I don't know this question of compassion I mean it's it's interesting one of the reviews I think it was by Tim Stanley um I can't remember whether it's for the Telegraph or or somewhere but he's a Christian and he was sort of writing from a Christian perspective and saying oh well it's a bit Christian but it's not really Christian enough but in a way it is quite Christian <laughs> the book um implicitly in the sense of it has this sort of universalism it has this kind of um I, I, I use the word cosmic to talk about not only sexual difference, but also a kind of um, absurdist relationship to the universe, which I think is what we embrace together. It's so to get away from the idea that one sex knows better, which is kind of fetishism mm. of one side or the other. You know, I think we both don't know. Right. <laughs> you know and and, and the point is that we we find out together or we, 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 we don't find out very much, but we try. And yeah, so so I don't know. Compassion is an in interesting one. I, I yeah, I think. Sorry, just to conclude, this, I'm being a bit rambling, but I think we live in a culture that really prioritizes a kind of zero sum game idea, which is what I'm criticizing the book. The idea that if one sex benefits, then the other must lose, or that there's right. somehow there's like a quanta of desire, or that you know that, that it's measurable, or that suffering is measurable, and it can only be apportioned out. And you know, we say, oh, this group suffers now, therefore this other group doesn't suffer, which is just bollocks, you know. Can I, can I ask you a question about that yeah. zero sum game very quickly? And this is kind of the, 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 social, the socialism question, right? Uh, if we are thinking of men as a class, yeah. uh, you know, so much of Marxism is the call for class war, right? Yeah. Um, how, do, how, does, how does compassion reconcile itself with mm. this kind of very foundational idea of class war? 
um, mm. which is, seems it seems to me very antithetical to compassion in a lot of ways, right? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, but if you're thinking about compassion, like within the working class, I mean, this is very important. You know, solidarity is another name for compassion in a certain way. You know, so, yeah, yeah I mean, even within this sort of antagonistic structure of exploitation and um, alienation, you know, then there is solidarity among those people who are opposed to that. And that goes across the sexes. And this is, again, something that Colin Ty, you know, I don't mention in the book, but I have written about elsewhere at length, um, you know, makes very clear that even where there are divisions between men and women, or even where there are historical forms of oppression or differences in terms of, you know, violence and so on, that the, the fundamental solidarity between men and women, it outstrips their, um, if you like, uh, division at the level right. of class yeah if so, people do want to talk about compassion for men i mean we're yeah, yeah. like let's not forget we're here talking to you about your book about compassion for men there's definitely something there right there's there's some sort of uh there's some sort of desire for this signifier to happen in the mm. correct way and it's been a lot of it's been recapitulated by the right this is not the first time because you know i've been in university, I'm like, you know, I don't know about these professors. And then suddenly I hear Jordan Peterson says, well, you know, I don't know about these professors. And I said, that's my line. And I'm not you. <laughs> right. And I can't imagine to get, you know, his face on your on your book review. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Compassion, no, I, 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 compassion for men immediately associated with conservatism. It is. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's a good point. And, and I agree with what Nina was saying as well. I think that, I mean, I get students, thir third year students, dis one who, who are coming to me and wanting to do their dissertation on why we, what, how we need compassion for men. You know, this mm -hmm. is something people are attracted to uh, as, a, as a topic. And I think you're absolutely right, Nina, to be. And I, I think in, 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 I was thinking when you were answering Elliot's question as well that, you know, uh, what you what you call in the book this kind of punitive culture, you know, that isn't class war. That, that's in a way what you're saying. It, right. Compassion is much more like socialist class war than this punitive culture that you're identifying. Would, would that be right? Yeah, no, no, completely. I mean, I think this kind of divisive culture which apportions suffering and says, you know, again, some groups suffer and some groups don't is, I mean, is reactionary. That's the that's reactionary culture, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean... First of all, you know, in a way, it's like to diagnose, the, as I say, the popularity of figures like Jordan Peterson. It's not enough to dismiss them. I think there's this kind of tendency on the left to sneer, you know, at, oh, like, oh, of course, you know, these people are idiots. Oh, how, yeah. how could anyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, and it's like, well, no, no, actually, the more important question is to diagnose. It's like if somebody is is answering a need, it's like, what's the need that's not being met? Right. So, you know, is it is it for a father? Is it for someone yeah. just telling you to look after yourself? You know, so I say, in fact, that you know, actually somebody stepping in and saying tidy your room is 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 not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's, it's usually what mothers say to their teenage <laughs> teenagers and not are not listened to. Yeah. But it's, you know, to actually have somebody say, take responsibility for yourself and you won't get a girlfriend unless you sort yourself out. It's not necessarily bad for women, you know, and I think it's kind of interesting. And and I think the kind of the structuralist the desire on the left to kind of always blame structures has gone a bit wrong. You know, it's like right. to constantly say, oh, it's the fault of the patriarchy. It's the fault of, the, of, of capitalism. It's the fault of, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like um, it's too easy. You know, yeah. it, it, it actually doesn't help individuals if they haven't, if they're suffering, which we all do at certain points and we all are in some ways. Right. So, you know, to, to kind of to totally evacuate, the idea of the individual, I don't think is a left project either. Like, I mean, if you read the German ideology, Marx says, we don't really even know what an individual is. Like, we're so narrowed in our current state that actually, but we're actually polyvalent. And, you know, it, the only image of communism is in a way is like free time such that polyvalence can be explored. So we're not even proper individuals now, but there is a socialist, uh, the, the idea of the social individual, which would be everybody kind of expressing themselves socially, collectively, but it's not anti-individualistic either, you know, it's like, yeah. it's so, yeah, I think, 
there's there's that <laughs> yeah no well there are two things in what you were saying I wanted to pick up on I mean first I come back to this idea of like what the points you make in the book about structure and blaming structures um but but first to talk about the title and that because I think what you were just saying there about what about um you know Peterson as a symptom okay what desire does this answer in a way that's the whole question isn't it of what what do men want and and why and how the book uh, that's a it's a brilliant title for exactly that reason that you're you're interested in in looking at things and, and not just dismissing them but saying okay well what what are these mm -hmm. things a symptom of what kind of dies and I suppose in, a, in another way this is the question about psychoanalysis you know so because this psychoanalysis as the thing which you know as the, the sort of a way of thinking through you know desire and, and 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 how it works and how it can be seen as a symptom of political social cultural conditions and psychoanalysis is kind of a tool to understand those things and you know you do your podcast the lack you're always the psychoanalysis running through this book the title is psychoanalytic so I just wondered if you could say something to that and what what you think psychoanalysis can do uh, in this situation yeah I mean the, the book isn't as deeply psychoanalytic as I would have liked it to be because it is a popular book right and it is actually it's kind of really hard to write a popular book <laughs> let me tell you like it's much easier to write like something academic or within a particular discipline um I don't necessarily recommend trying to <laughs> try to do it though. um so yeah I mean obviously there's a kind of joke reference to Freud a double joke reference to Freud what you know what what, do we, what does woman want and the civilizations and it's discontent so I changed to masculinity and it's discontent and I, I thought it would just be funny because I also did that with Marcuse with One Dimensional Man and I enjoy doing these like little puns with men's titles um so yeah so but I think the question of desire is sort of twofold at least you know there is a kind of popular idea of desire which is almost celebrated which is like well in this sort of hedonistic culture you should do what you want and what you want is good because you want it right and so I have this right. like jokey little list where I ask my male friends what do you want and they yeah, say like a shed, a shed or like a beer or pussy oh, yeah. or whatever, right so and of course you can't really there is no answer to the question of what men want and, and it's interesting when you know I get these sort of negative comments sometimes on Amazon or uh, on YouTube or something uh, under a video where someone who obviously hasn't read the book will say, oh, how dare she? You know, who is this woman telling us what men want? You know, and it's like, <laughs> that's what I'm doing, you know. So I, so obviously the whole thing is kind of a joke. Yeah. Well, it's addressed you know? rather quickly in your, in your book that this is, this is a question that isn't answered necessarily by, you know, it, the, the, the real answer is, uh, uh, you know, if you ask somebody directly, they'll they'll give you an they'll give you what they want, but it's not really the thing. It's about the question itself and masculinity, yeah. right? And that's 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 what I really like about this book, you know. And I I picked this up because in my own kind of personal um, para academic <laughs> circles, uh, uh, with, you know, there's a big there's a big Nina split. You know, there's Con Conrad Hamilton wrote like a polemic against and then Barrett, who wrote him hate mail, who's <laughs> like what? big Nina fan. And he's like, oh, I hate Conrad. We're all, so, I'm, I'm all, yeah, all pro, we're all pro, pro Nina in my house. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it, is, it, is it is like a convert, but but I love this idea. And, you know, for myself, what really did it for me um, was you can treat a signifier itself you can treat men right in terms yeah. of men need compassion and men goodness with men right what is male yeah. goodness and i think yeah. that's i think that is a, the right question i think that is a good yeah. question well, that's that's the sort of conclusion i came to in the in the kind of research was really that they're indissociable also for women you know the question of what it means to be a woman what it means to a man is is completely tied up with what it means to be a good man and a good woman not in the sense of fulfilling particular criteria right and this is the mistake that people make the idea that oh in order to be a good man you must do the following five things right but it is precisely as you say to keep open the question and to not yeah. close it off so if you have a culture that basically it, exactly. says huh not foreclose the question isn't that psychosis you're for that's that well, is yeah. that the formal the formal definition of psychosis for closing the name of the father Right. So basically, you know, you have a culture that increasingly tells you that men can't be good, that they're sort of ontologically bad. Right. Which I think is very, very dangerous because of the whole self-fulfilling prophecy. If you if you run around telling men that they're just kind of evil and, and you know, awful, what's to stop them saying, fine, yeah, we are. <laughs> like, Let's behave in that way. Right. 
Whereas if you have a culture that says, no, men are already good and here are some ways, right? There's not one way of being good, but to keep open the question and to say it is a horizon of possibility for men and women that not only can they be good, but they can also be better. And that would include myself, right? I, you know, as somebody who's also like, you know, suffered my own idiocies and like <laughs> had to deal as everybody does, right? With various crises, right. you know, and, and problems. It's like, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's precisely to say, look, yeah, and, and the reason why the right are answering these questions, it is true, mm. right? So you do have this entire discourse which says, uh, which generally opposes contemporary left liberal culture, right? And unpopular culture in general says, look, men are being told that they're idiots. If you look at adverts, if you look at contemporary media, men are always being depicted as if they're like useless, pathetic, stupid, and so on, which is true. They are, right? And then you have, well, here's another way of doing it, right? Go to the gym, get fit, you know, read books. Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's a bit, you right, know, the gross. But <laughs> the popular masculine culture, you know, and that's that's what makes your book up, like you said, to write a popular book. As I'm kind mm. of reading this theory, I'm like seeing mm. you mention all these kinds of like very underground, like low you know, in the in the culture, low things like uh, you know the the manosphere, the no fap, even yeah. right. Yeah, they were uh, how, do you, how do you sublate and for sublation media, which is how do you sublate no, <laughs> right? Which is how do you have compassion for these kinds of low forms? They're like yeah. they are kind of unspeakable, um, you know. But it's under, human. I mean, values, right? you know, on some level, we're all human. It's like you know, I I. <sighs> I think it's like I walk around the world, I speak to whoever, I try to be nice. It's like, you know, you try to get along with everyone. It's, it's like we live in this world, right? I think the problem with the kind of utopian leftism, it thinks that you can, um, I don't know, somehow act as if you're already living in the world you want to see that would not include the people that you currently don't right. like. Yeah, right. Definitely. And and this and this goes back to your split thing. You know, it's like this, you know, I mean, I really appreciate you guys talking to me because you know, I think you're probably about the leftist people who were ever going to ask me to speak about this book. <laughs> you know, and and this goes back a few years. It's like I said repeatedly to people, let's talk, right? If you're upset with me because of something I've said, let's talk won't. about it. And they won't. They absolutely no. refuse to, including people I was really good friends with. Well, yeah. they, you know, it's easy for them to say, oh, Nina's bad now. Or, you know, yeah. they, they hint darkly that I must be secretly harboring some sort of, you know, fascist views or something um, <laughs> and therefore you know you don't need to speak to her because she's yeah. kind of gone wrong well it's as if their microcosm is important rather than the big issues which exactly. is the, you know that's the biggest yeah. thing that frustrates me in theory when it's and in, like, in a way i mean of like you know you're talking about you're important because you're talking about big issues not because your microcosm is this yeah that. exactly no i mean i was gonna say something really similar i mean this book is actually in a, in a sense a response to them that that kind of attitude and it's a diagnosis of those attitudes but it's not about that it's not about you in that way it's about the bigger issues that this kind of punitive culture uh mm -hmm. or good bad culture um kind of creates which i think is is is, is it's, it's extremely important that those things that are discussed you know and, and i guess i just wanted also to pick up on something you were saying there or or you guys were just talking about um these and because another thing about this book that might not be obvious to people who haven't read it is that it's also a, as you said earlier a kind of delve into this kind of weirder online right in a certain way you know that there, there are some you, some of the case studies discussions let's call them they they go into this kind of much more like yeah online undercultures or whatever subcultures and then on the other hand, there's the the mainstream. This kind of like yeah, Peterson vibe, Jim going. Let's say uh, you know. So so let, let let me ask it this way: like, do you see like the the, the same patterns uh, of of masculinity in these two? Because I think somewhere you talk about the mainstream. You know, mainstream masculinity. Let's call it for a want of a better word. Uh, and then compared with you know these uh, sort of subcultural uh, examples let's call them like no fap or what that men go their own way you know uh like do you see the freud same was no fap, by the way so sorry for the unprofessional interruption freud What's was that? distinctly no fap <laughs> oh, yeah? anti masturbation he's right you know part of yeah. part of his diagnoses for people were that oh they're <laughs> masturbating that's why oh uh, yeah that's true you know, that's interesting a reminder <laughs> but I suppose I'm intrigued in the question of like, do we see 
Yeah, because this is this this is often used, isn't it? Like look look at like look at some far right men. That's how bad all men are, kind of yeah. thing. Or you know, so so what do you say? Or do you actually sometimes it seems like yeah, you're you're actually showing compassion and empathy, as Elliot said, with with communities that are often completely dismissed uh, on the on the left, let's call it, or among the liberals. So, yeah. so what's all that about, and what what do you sort of see happening there? Well, I mean, I think actually often what's going on is that the the political accusation isn't always accurate, it, it, but it's used as a warning sign. It's like saying don't hear be dragons you know it's like oh mm. uh, you know so actually like something like no fab it isn't political necessarily at all right like it's a load of men who yeah, yeah. you know almost always uh, overwhelmingly men saying oh god I'm, I'm sick of being addicted to pornography i want to stop tossing myself off all the time it's no longer fun it's ruining my experience of the world i can no longer speak to women i walk around in shame you know i feel absolutely awful you know, and you encounter this community and they do like a 30 day challenge or whatever, you know, no porn, no, no masturbation. And, you know, it, in itself, it's, it is not political, right? This is, this is, you know, something that people just might want to do. It, it, and I think it, it kind of gets very, very creepy when you have people describing like NoFap as like hate groups and, you know, um, and that they, they must be dodgy because actually porn is good. You know, I think there's a kind of like leftist liberal hedonism, which is like completely mm. um, doesn't investigate the. All th yeah, all things lead to the sneer. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the sneer. They do, the sneer, man. You know, it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, so I, so I think there's a politicization, but it's coming from the left, if you see what I mean. Often yeah. it's like, oh, these, you know, don't go over yeah. there. Don't read that. Don't read these books. Don't read these men. You know they're Nazis or something. Yeah, that's absolutely right, and it goes to the heart of the question of like, why does why are these things appealing? You know that the, the the left there is treating the symptom rather than the cause. You know, and saying, you know, look at this problem that's emerged here in this pocket of the internet, rather than asking the question how actually what you know what do men want you know how, how has this happened you know what's the root cause of this and and the kind of compassionate left if, if we want to use that that term would be like okay That's we disagree really you know <laughs> but let's let's see if like let's say we disagree on immigration let's say we have a different view of the world we have a different view of what's important like if if the left thinks it's got such good arguments then it needs to take them and bring them to people and, and explain them not go, oh, we actually don't like the people, but we're right. <laughs> but unfortunately, we've lost the working class because we hate yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, I mean... exactly. That's that's quite right. That's totally right. <laughs> yeah. There can be an addiction to like the heavy hand, the authoritative, we're going to make these people be this way. And I think, you but know, it's it's all just meetings. you know, I mean, I have a friend who yeah. says that the, the reason why a lot of leftists he thinks supported the lockdowns and was, were very pro this kind of imprisonment logic was because they wanted to punish people for not voting the right way in Brexit, you know. Yeah. That there is this kind of like le liberal sa left sadism. <laughs> That's absolutely <laughs> right. That's absolutely yeah. right. I mean, one of the other things. I mean, this is obviously a, a big topic, but we, we're kind of all agree. So, <laughs> but but um, I, I wanted to talk about a couple of other things that were more, maybe more uh, sort of um, you know, not secondary things, but on the, on the side of what's going on. But what one of those was play. There's a whole chapter about play. Uh, I find this really interesting as a as a as a from the perspective of video games as a, as a gamer myself. Also, this connection between games and the the, the basement dwelling men and uh, the questions of desire there. But in a sense, I was surprised to find the chapter you know, not so much just about games and gamer culture, but also about the question of play. And you, you actually look at theory of play from Huizinga onwards, and and you, you actually kind of make this argument in that chapter that, like, we need to rehabilitate a kind of play, mm -hmm. um, right, uh, and, and and redeem a kind of play, and that this can, this can help uh, form a, a better, more compassionate future. So I thought it'd be interesting to hear uh, something about that, Nina. Yeah, I mean, I was I was talking to a very um, prominent <laughs> British psychoanalyst a few years ago, and about this book when I started it, and he suggested that um, I call it first person shooter because he thought this mm. was the the for him at least the dominant model image of contemporary masculinity is this kind of like gun, under yeah. siege, you know, like looking down the barrel of a gun, like this kind of thing, and it's a very interesting idea. But I didn't ultimately go with that as the kind of image of, of of the gamer the masculine gamer it was a bit too restrictive for me but but I took his point and I elsewhere I've written about like depressive suicidal black metal and this kind of um feeling of utter aloneness that H, like someone like HB Zero Lovecraft who's a sort of you know pseudonymous cult sort of you know right wing uh right novelist 
um, <laughs> talks about like this kind of feeling of kind of total aloneness in the face of the universe, right? So, that, and whether that is gen gendered or sexed in particular ways, and I think it, it is interestingly, but again, it's quite controversial to talk about it. Like, do men feel more alone than women? <laughs> He's quite an interesting guy. He I is think. highly yeah. reactionary, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you know, he does write these very slice of life kind of things which are yeah i mean he's very very insightful and i think his anonymity mm -hmm. allows him maybe to write things that other people are inhibited by it, it, fictionally anyway i think contemporary fiction is very inhibited at the moment um but on the question of play yeah it was because i suppose it's yeah it's partly to do with the sort of like i don't know like yeah nostalgic socialism or something like you know what we what are we actually after like free time right and like <laughs> you know, this this idea of like discovering things together and, and making up our own games. And I think I just got, uh, you know, with the, with the sort of, uh, I don't know, technium and the kind of app culture, it's, yeah. it's almost like the, the the gaming or the playfulness, which we could sometimes describe as flirtation, but not only, right? I mean, I'm clear to say that this isn't a, about heterosexuality, but about heterosociality, right? Like in the broader sense, right? So not everything is about a romantic or sexual relationship between the sexes, but it, you know that that's obviously there are gay people and there is friendship between men and women as well and but it's about a certain kind of openness to contingency and risk which is clearly being kind of um curtailed you know in 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 the form of various sort of technological shifts so yeah. the idea of having a conversation with someone in a bar would be would be sort of frowned upon if it wasn't organized through the app you know what i mean like yeah. um so that kind of playfulness is also like an openness to the universe as well. Like what might happen, right. the encounter. I mean, yeah. right. Youth culture has changed drastically as well in terms of in the last 20 years, 50% of high school students would hang out with friends after school. And that mm. number has dropped to or 10%. That's really? a massive, that's such I, a massive I, um, shift, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's it. really interesting. What a, a, a good a good answer um, I also was coming at that chapter thinking about my daughter she's six right so she's at this age of of play let's say where her and her friends play and you you witness them playing all the time now obviously gender is built into their play and so too is capitalism and the structure of their play inherits certain characteristics and things from you know society even from day one as, as I'm sure Freud would, would would think but but at the same time there is, there is this kind of aspect to it which yet hasn't yet been territorialized uh, uh and and so on and, and I, I sort of so i did i did kind of the argument rang true that basically at a certain point in a contemporary young person's life that kind of prey get play gets pressed out and grabbed by these forces of organization which now includes gamification and and tech uh and so on but historically had other manifestations probably and that that kind of play that had the potential to develop kind of compassion across genders and other kinds of compassion across sexes i should have said uh you know uh, is pressed out by certain conditions which are presumably capitalist but also other things yeah and it also is about playing with sex as well in certain ways right as in you know sexual difference it's mm. it's like now we have this kind of reification this desire to reify everything and say well this is that this is you know as opposed to a permitting i think what's been destroyed really is imagination you know and i, I say this for pornography too apart from the material harms that pornography involves pornography destroys that capacity to fantasize you know, because it, it completely fills it in with images which don't belong to you, that aren't your life, you know, that aren't about your relationships to other people. And, and you know, and, and so it's the imagination that is basically being captured and reified and, as you say, like um, sort of ploughed into the technium like very early on, you know, and, and given a name. And, of course, there's a there's a simple way because, oh, well, it's consumerist, right? Okay, so, look, they're mm. toys and they're, they're gendered in these ways. But it's kind of deeper than that. It's it's like a kind of yeah. enclosure of yeah, like the, the 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 capacity to play, which then gets kind of like beaten out of your funneled into these gamified yeah. things, which are all too compatible with jobs. You know, like everything yeah. becomes like a kind of pedometer or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, I like your that, description that. of oh, sorry, of evil gamification at work. Like yeah, I mean, that, that Amazon would do for your piss breaks, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you get no, this. No, I mean, that's... Um, here. Isn't that fun, right? Versus compassionate yeah. play and a positive kind of... What would a positive play? Uh, yeah, like the open-ended really play where you don't have a sense of time. And, you know, it, 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 there's no end to it necessarily. Like the infinite dialogue or the conversation with a friend. It's for its own delight, you know. And I'm very mm -hmm. influenced by, by Ivan Illich, you know, who's, as I mentioned a couple of times in the book, you know, who's this 
sort of subversive Catholic priest who's kind of excommunicated. And but but these kinds of things are very, very central to his way of seeing things, right? Like these questions of conviviality and um particular forms of time that that go, that cut against the institutional time and the, the time of modernity and all of these things, you know, which we can kind of pull back from, you know, wherever we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, well, this 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 leads back to this question about structure, which will be my my last question, and then I don't know if Elliot, you've got one last, but we, we'll um, we'll wrap up soon. But but we, I said I, I wanted to come back to this point you made in the book that uh, you, you you mentioned earlier, actually, the need to stop thinking in terms of um, these kind of bigger structures, and and for example, patriarchy or whatever as one of those, and and this conversation about play is an example of one of the alternative approaches right that instead of thinking about the bigger you're thinking a more micro human to human sort of interaction rather than uh thinking about things in these kind of big structures so i just wondered if you could could kind of go back to that because you, you just sort of touched upon it like this idea of what do we do instead i suppose of, of thinking in terms of these big structures you know what, what would you say that as the alternative to this and you do propose like that kind of some alternatives i guess in the book yeah, I mean, I didn't want to give too many examples, if you saw what I mean, because that would that would sort of be over-determining it, right? It's not like, you know, and it, is, it isn't like a self-help book. It's not like saying, oh, here is what you should <laughs> no. do. To, you know, it's like, it's, it's sort of trying to operate in a different space whilst also talking about those diagnoses and not even being critical of them in a, in a way, but um, just to sort of, yeah, understanding them symptomatically. But I think... I, th I think, yeah, it's a very complicated question because there is a, there is a sort of moral dimension to this, and there is a kind of question of how one, as an individual, both critiques the the form of individualism that we all have all inherited. Like we're all liberal subjects, right? There's no kind of getting away from that in a mm. certain way, and that there's some very negative aspects to that. We're, we are all um, part of this particular economic structure, and we, of course, we would want to look at it and say, how does it work? you know, is the Marxist diagnosis still correct, uh, and so on, and, and you know, where, where is value and, and, and exploitation and all these things. At the same time, I, I don't think we can afford to completely eradicate the, the sense of almost like moral responsibility, or at least responsibility for one's own desire, that isn't what we're being told it is, right? So it's like the kind of, this is what I meant about the second desire, you know, it's like the you know, yes, we can give a joke answer, like what do men want? I want this, you know, what does this man want? You know, um, but it's it's this kind of holding open this place really, which is, you know, uh, almost like a kind of co place of a possible collective psychoanalysis. And I'm very interested in Nadi Lang and these kind of projects, all of which kind of failed, we have to say, right? And, and But those kind of attempts to think about um, all of those structures like, the family and the social in the broadest possible sense without reducing anyone's pathology to themselves, but also taking it seriously, I suppose. And I think there's a kind of sometimes a way of thinking about structure, which almost completely eliminates the individual to such a detrimental degree that the, the individual becomes completely irrelevant, navigated and, and almost like this guilty function mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, you, you know, if you have any privilege whatsoever that you yeah. must be, uh, I don't know, some sort of terrible, awful person. And I think this isn't leftism. Like, this isn't politics. This is something else. This is the worst aspects of religion without the good bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And this point that, you know, we're all liberal subjects, you know, it, it goes, ties, ties, in a sense, it ties all, everything together there because, you know, you, you, you don't have a pure... You, you know, you don't have a pure subject who, who like pu a puritanical subject who the other people are are guilty, uh, mm -hmm. and this this that's not the situation. And if you acknowledge that, then the compassion stuff becomes more possible. I think. Um, yeah, also for yourself, you know. I mean, you have all these yeah. people running around who are just like, you know, I'm the worst person in the world, which is also a form <laughs> of narcissism as well. Let's be mm. clear, you know. And that this, whether you feel that you're the best person or the worst person, you're still treating yourself as an exception. Um, and I think this is very brutal. Like this culture is so brutal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially like I, I don't know how to how to put it. It's like, you know, the it's much like I I was brought up with a much a slightly different ethic, right? Which was something like life isn't fair, everybody makes mistakes, you know, that kind of thing. And now it's like yeah. life is very unfair for some people and not for others and if you make a mistake you're evil and should be punished forever and excluded from all your social groups or something and it's like no no hang on <laughs> like mm. 
<laughs> this isn't like <laughs> go on. Your, your your book um it really challenged me because I think I had some internalized misandry, you know, the worst kind of sexism reverse. Anyway, bad joke. <laughs> no, but um, but you know, it challenged me in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of like, how willing am I to be close to men? Mm. And you know, I you know, typically I very easily say uh, to someone who it's like it's fine, just don't be by me even just I read the book and the old man kind of sits kind of close to me in the bus I think before I read the book I'd be like oh, I'm gonna uh, this fucking guy's sitting in my proximity uh, but now I'm like I need to have compassion <laughs> and some modicum of respect for for uh for for even men to be close and to exist socially I think I do <laughs> reflectively uh you know I think you can easily link masculinity with a kind of you know the two things you link with individualism which is brutality mm. and calculation right um but i think it is a good project to not do that <laughs> this reflexive identifying men with uh these other kind of uh ideas of into, well, it, into yeah like, it's um, it's really interesting for you to say that it's um it's yeah i mean one of the conversations i had like with the guys from trigonometry that they didn't want to accept at all really they're very resistant to was um this idea of thinking about men as a class mm, you know, that, right. that actually there is a form of implicit as you say like almost that like individualism built into masculinity even where men are thinking of themselves as socialists or communists or whatever that that actually somehow thinking of of men as as not yeah. only customs but thinking of men as a class it and i because i because i think women maybe for for social reasons or whatever much more often think of themselves as part of a class or at least they you know and, and de Beauvoir makes this point as well I, a long time ago in the 40s it's like for whatever reasons <laughs> I think women are often treated or treat themselves as exemplars of a class um and it and it's interesting to think where and why yeah. and if men do that and what if, if not why not you know yeah I mean I think that's really in you know I, in my instinct is to, to say yeah it's something to do with individualism that is so inherently built in that you there's a resistance to seeing yourself as just a member of a class but it's not uh, just yeah right? but, but yeah exactly but yeah also, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but it's fascinating right because then but then what is individualism is it character is it you know it's like we live in an era of identity, right? Which isn't mm. the same as character or personality. Like those are the two things that seem to have been eliminated, in fact, in favor of identity. Yes. Yeah. But what then is, so, so I don't know, masculinity or being a man becomes like the default identity mm -hmm. that isn't one, that therefore can be demonized and criticized. Yes. Yeah. Amanda's and identity and yeah. Amanda's class is like two different ideas, I think. Yeah. You get two yeah. different results from the, from the male uh, Joe Rogan, barbecue sauce identity versus what are men suffering as a class and like, yeah. how do you yeah. and, and a set as sort of the the it goes back to our first question the the, pre the preference for sex over gender is is part of of that sex is not an identity in this yeah. way no and it, it's not but it's not over determined either right like it yeah. doesn't you know the, the the whole point is it's this kind of question or this openness um that has a particular reality but not but in a way what follows from it is um not determined <laughs> yeah 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 well I think, I think that's right well i think we should i mean nina any last things you feel like you need to say about this book or or, or about this, <laughs> these topics i feel like we've done we've done a really interesting no uh, it's good i really i really appreciate this take on it i think i mean look, i've done a lot of these you know sort of publicity things and interviews yeah. and you know people are coming from different angles and i you know i, I sort of appreciate the opportunity to talk more psychoanalytically um, a little bit, you know, it's, a, and, and, you know, it's not a psychoanalytic book, but it is sort of informed by it in some ways, you know. Yeah, so. I mean, I think so. And I think it offers a lot to psychoanalysis as well, because it's about, about politicising it and showing how, you know, and I, I, in my opinion anyway, is that some of the best writing on psychoanalysis is not about, is not on psychoanalysis, you know, it's informed by it and it's the yeah. approach is deeply psychoanalytic and it shows how that way of thinking can cut through some of the problems in existing, let's say, normal ways of thinking. And so it's a perfect example of how psychoanalysis can function for me. Yeah, I mean, I guess just one final thing is, you know, there is a discussion of, of Freud's idea in the, the 3S is on sexuality about this kind of constitutive bisexuality idea not that we fancy both men and women but that we are both we are you know men and women are also comprised of masculine and feminine 
dimensions, which obviously gets kind of taken up by Jung in a particular way, um, which is in a way more the more dominant idea, except people like Peterson don't really necessarily emphasise the constitutive um, bisexuality, if you see what I mean. Like they kind of put them more in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But well, they, they, I, I, they emphasize the opposite duality, don't they? Men and the an, men embracing the anima, right? Women yeah. embracing the animas. But I think I think Freud was was really onto something. <laughs> Whether we talk about passivity or activity, or you know, and it, it's 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 where you place, I suppose, sexual difference in a certain way, and how we relate to sexual difference on the basis of our sex, whilst holding it open as a question in terms of our, you know, being in the world. And I, I think it can't be foreclosed. And I think, yeah, what, what, what we're seeing, what we're living through is like a really dangerous foreclosure of this, as if there is yeah. a, a solution. Punitive foreclosure, sneer culture, the compassionate yeah. left. Nina, you're part of the compassionate left. Yeah. No matter, yeah, no matter how many, um, no matter how many guardian think pieces there might be. 